Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first residency VMR of this match cycle. I'm very happy to see you all here. And today, to open up with this program, we have the Sinai Baltimore Internal Medicine Residency Program. Dr. Ravi is here. Would you like to introduce your program, Dr. Ravi, and all the members from your program that are here? Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm um, very delighted to be here today amongst friends. Uh, we have Yasmin, Madalena, Prisa, Anmol. Alina is here, Mariana is here, Minal is here, uh, all the CPS friends. If I, if, I, if I didn't name you, I just apologize. But it's uh, so good to be here amongst everybody here to bring our program to you. So to kick off the IMG initiative and our program, I think, uh, has been intertwined with CS, CPS for a while. We have some CPS Academy members since we started this Academy um, membership for people to to uh, mentor uh, a lot of the community and help them through this journey. I've uh, been very privileged to have at least two members join our program. And uh, Gia just joined last year, and then Franco should be here as well. He's now currently a PGY3. But um, uh, I think... As an IMG initiative, I think Sinai caters to a lot of the IMG resident population and um, the the applicants. And a little bit about Sinai, um, uh, it's a pretty old um, uh, teaching hospital in Baltimore. I think it originally started about over 100, 100 years ago, and it's probably one of the oldest uh, residency programs in, in Baltimore, Maryland. And the origins of Maryland, if nobody knows, but uh, it was founded, I think, back in 1631, which was uh, one of the British colonies back uh, then. And um, we have a, a good number of residents, and we'll, we'll talk about the program um, right after we finish a uh, presenting a case. So I'm going to hand the mic back over to Yasmin. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Like, uh, again, we're very, very happy to have our case presenters here. Uh, proud CP Solver members too. And, uh, but first, let me introduce your this case discussions for today. First is Maddie, Dr. Conti, PGY1. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Dr. Conti is, is funny. Um, not used to hearing that, but yeah. Hey everyone, I am Maddie. I am a proud CP Solvers member and I'm so happy to be here co-discussing alongside Parisa and Mariana and Yaz, huge shout out to you for organizing these sessions. I know last year you and the team organized, I don't even know how many, but these are just such valuable sessions to get to learn about the amazing programs. And Sinai, as Ravi said, is kind of intertwined with CP Solvers. And um, from everything I've heard about it, it's such a phenomenal program. So uh, I'm just so happy to be here and can't wait to discuss and learn more about um, the program. Thank you so much, Maddie. And it's not only my hard work, Debs right now, shout out to Debs. Maybe she will see the, the recording later. Happy wedding to our friend. Um, we have our next discussant, uh, future PGY1. Parisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Parisa IMG from Iran and uh, CPS team member. I'm so grateful to be part of this session and really huge shout out to Yaz to be applicant and doing all of this uh, hard work to arranging all of this session. I'm so excited to be co-discussing with Maddie and Mariana. Thank you, Paris. And again, not only me, it's all of you. Thank you for being participating here. And our third case discussion, Mariana. Another future PGY1, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Mariana. I am an international medical graduate from Brazil. I'm also a CIP Solvers team member, and I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you, everyone from the Sinai Hospital to uh, be with us, and let's tackle this together. Great. Now, our case presenters, Franco and Gia, would you like to give us some words, introduce yourselves to? Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jia. Uh, proud to be one of uh, the CP solvers and also proud to be one of the member of the Sinai uh, Hospital. Uh, so I get to present the case today. I'm very excited to see uh, so many familiar faces in the Zoom meeting. Yeah. 
And hi, everybody. I'm Franco, PY3 at Sign A, and also part of the wonderful City Solvers family. And I cannot wait to get to shine in this session and meet everybody. It's going to be an amazing day. Great. So uh, if we can put up the whiteboard, um, I don't I don't remember who's subscribing today. Mm -hmm. If not, I can share it. No worries. Let me share my screen so we can all start. There you go. Whenever you're ready, you can start the case, friends. Okay, sure. Uh, today, I uh, my case has uh, five aliquot, and with the last aliquot, we will review the diagnosis. Uh, so I will start with the first aliquot. Uh, so uh, today, we have a 77-year-old female uh, with the medical history of diabetes and hyperlipidemia, uh, presented with abdomen pain and vomiting. I will stop here. Okay, uh, I can start. Thank you, Gia, for presenting this uh, Alika to us. I, I think when we are having a patient who is presenting with abdominal pain and vomiting, uh, considering the, uh, I think usually morbidity pushing us to think about the, uh, although it's presenting with abdominal pain, but we all also need to think about other things outside the GI, including the uh, cardiac causes and in, uh, intracranial catastrophic causes we need to get the EKG to make sure that it, it is this this is not coming from uh, myocardial infarction and we also need to do the neuro exam to make sure that uh, it is not coming from any anything inside the uh, skull and after that we need to find out why the vagal nerve is activated the most common cause for an um, vagal nerve activation usually it's uh, upper GI tract uh, in CPS, we usually having the uh, VPO mnemonic. Maddie taught me the, the VPO mnemonic, which we usually using for uh, the, um, the the life threatening causes of abdominal pain, and uh, we could uh, which is info, we, we could start from there. V starts for uh, stands for vascular causes, is ischemia, for example, the mesenteric ischemia. I stands for inflammation, any causes of uh, for example, gastritis and any gastroenteritis. Uh, P stands for perforation and O stands for obstruction. We need to get more information to frame it from there. And uh, I think for me, the other framework I'm having in combination of abdominal pain and uh, plus vomiting, I'm also thinking, I'm, I'm thinking it about anatomically. I'm thinking that is this coming from lumen, is this any ulcer or erosion? Is this coming from the wall, including thickening or infiltration? Or uh, is this coming from any metabolic causes, including uremia? But absolutely, I need to get more information to frame it from there. Pass the mic to you, Manny. Parisa, that was absolutely brilliant. I The only thing I can add is just to emphasize some of the points you made, but I am right there with you. And, and just to emphasize, I just want to pull out a few things that you said that I think are so important here that when we think of abdominal pain, of course, you know, our focus goes towards the abdomen, but you made a really good point that you need to consider organs and pathology above the abdomen and specifically the things you don't want to miss are an acute coronary syndrome. And um, as you mentioned, and we're seeing that this is a 77-year-old female, she has a history of diabetes, and so we know women can have atypical presentations of acute coronary syndrome, and patients with diabetes can also have atypical presentations. So I just, I thought that was a really important point um, that I just wanted to emphasize. And like you, I, um, I love the VIPO framework just because it's a helpful way to kind of go through the do not miss causes, as you said, vascular inflammation, perforation, obstruction. And um, I think that first pass is very helpful, especially in this context, we're seeing that she has some risk factors that may increase her risk for some of those conditions. So we know diabetes, dyslipidemia, she may have underlying coronary disease that may increase her risk for a vascular event, for example. Um, 
And yeah, the other thing I would just be curious about is um, given that uh, Gia has given us a little bit of insight into her past medical history is I'm curious about this patient's diabetes. You know, how well controlled is it? What is her most recent A1C? Do we need to consider is that, you know, DKA, which is a very common cause of abdominal pain in someone with diabetes? So um, yeah, Preetza, I think you had such a fantastic discussion and wanted to emphasize looking above the abdomen to make sure this is not a cardiac event, especially with the risk factors going through the VIPO mnemonic. Um, and then last thing to add is just the fact that this patient is having vomiting um, with the abdominal pain. I think to me, that is a red flag that this is something we really need to get to the bottom of. And I'm kind of seeing the vomiting as like a marker of the severity. And this is clearly pretty severe. Um, so that's the only thing I would add, but phenomenal discussion so far, Parisa. Back to you, Gia. Yeah, sure. Let me give you more information. Uh, so for the uh, history, the patient uh, the patient came uh, with this uh, ab gastric pain for the past five days. Uh, she started vomiting uh, the one days ago, and then had three episodes of vomiting where she was at home. Uh, there was no blood in the vomitors. The patient doesn't report any diarrhea. Uh, she does admit that uh, she has a history of peptic ulcer disease very remotely, and she is not on any medication for her as acid reflex. And also the patient denies any fevers or chills. Uh, that's the story. And for the social uh, history, the patient is from Philippines uh, and she arrived to the United States four months ago to visit her daughter. And uh, she uh, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't use any uh, substance, uh, drug, and also she denies any allergies. And for the medications, the patient was on uh, is on metformin and uh, atovacetin. I will stop here. All right. So, considering the history of this patient, um, what I think it's very important to consider here, uh, uh, first of all, thinking about the uh, diabetes. Um, patients with diabetes they can appear with. Uh, um, they can also have like neuropathy and gastroparesis. So I think it's very important to consider these etiologies here. But uh, for me, the most important thing is this, this patient has a history of peptic ulcer disease. So we have to consider perforation. And in these cases, a physical exam uh, will be very, very important. So if the patient has any signs of uh, guarding or rebound tenderness. Uh, in this case, we will we would prioritize management over diagnosis and we would have to uh, start uh, maybe a surgical consultation. So I think it's important to consider here. And uh, let me see what else. Oh, and uh, the social history is very important here. So patient was uh, is from Philippines. Uh, it's also very important to consider infectious, infectious causes here. Even though patient has no fever, we know that patients that are um, older, they, they can appear with infections with uh, no signs of fever. So I wouldn't rule out uh, infections yet. Back to you, Maddie. Mariana, I, I am right there with you. And I think, um, you know, um, hearing the time course and hearing the fact that there is vomiting with the abdominal pain, I love that you were thinking of, you know, of the VIPO do not miss causes. I was also kind of, you know, prioritizing, you know, perforation or even obstruction, because we know that bowel obstruction can frequently present with nausea and vomiting. So I love that of those VIPO, you were thinking about those. And um, yeah, I think, you know, how this makes progress, you know, I'm thinking ahead to what will we be, what will be kind of the rate limiting step in this case. And um, as we've talked about on VMR a few times, you know, very often in abdominal pain, it leads to a CT scan just because um, that those vascular inflammation, perforation, obstruction, to make those diagnoses, you need some imaging. And, um, you know, we've talked in the past, or like, what are some of the tests that you can send to uh, avoid a CT scan if, if so that you don't do unnecessary imaging? Um, and maybe before I kind of share those, Mariana and even Parisa, like what are your thoughts on, of course, we'll get a physical exam, which will influence our thinking, but what are some tests you think you would want to do before any potential imaging? I think the other test, as we talked earlier, I would 
do before the other imaging it's the EKG again because this patient has the diabetes and for a long time and I think uh, he also has the dyslipidemia I think my mind is still it's going through the other cardiovascular diseases although I think the timeline it is five days and it's make it even less likely to have the acute coronary vascular disease but because again because of the uh the, the morbidity of that diseases, I still have this on the top of my uh, list. And I, I think as Mariano was mentioning, because in the uh, elderly patient, even the as uh, infectious, something like septic shock may, may might present without the common presentation, we might also be keep that in our mind and be uh, careful about the blood pressure and the other vital sign of the patient. Be mindful of that as well. I completely, oh yeah, Mariana, were you gonna say something? I just would, uh, I was going to add that uh, ketones may be very helpful in this case. Maybe patient is in, on, uh, present with DKA, so we could uh, certainly uh, start managing uh, after we diagnose that. And another test that could be helpful in this case is a chest x-ray that would be faster than a, a, a CT. And we could have like uh, um, signs of perforation and we could over uh, management of, um, we could prioritize management over diagnosis if we had something like that. Yeah. No, I think those are brilliant points. And I, I totally agree with you guys. And I think, um, you know, some of the tests, exactly as you were saying, I was also thinking about an EKG, a point of clear glucose, lipase, ketones. Those are some of the big things that were crossing my mind that, you know, I imagine we may end up at a CT scan, but if one of those are positive, that might change our track. Um, yeah. And then looking towards the physical exam, because both of you talked about how perforation and obstruction are things we definitely don't want to miss in someone with abdominal pain um, and vomiting. I think on physical exam, what I'm going to look for, is there some type of abdominal distension? Is this diffuse abdominal pain or more localized to one quadrant? Is this limited to the abdomen or are there signs that the disease is also outside of the abdomen? Are there lung findings, skin findings? So those are the things I'm going to look out for. Um, and then Mariana, to your point on, on the vital signs, are we seeing a fever, some tachycardia? Uh, so those are the things I'm going to be keeping an eye out for. Um, um, Maddie, just one more point. I think I would also get a UA from this patient or because of the, uh, the diabetes this patient have, they put mm -hmm. them under risk of developing any kind of uh, cystitis and this kind of that, that, that category as well, just to put it, to keep it on our mind. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and as Gia said, you know, we, we're hearing that the, the diabetes is well controlled on metformin, but I definitely would be doing a, uh, some chart digging to see when the last A1C is, because I think how advanced the diabetes is can really sway her risk factors. All right, Gia, back to you. Yeah, great discussion. Uh, that's very comprehensive and detailed. Uh, so in the next article, I will mention the physical examination and also several labs. Uh, so during the physical examination, vitals, the patient is favorable, the temperature is 39.4, uh, and the heart rate is 85, respiratory rate is 18, and the blood pressure is 120 over 67. And the patient is saturated so we're at room air, uh, the saturation is 97 percentage. And uh, on the physical examination, actually, uh, there are not like very significant findings. The patient is not uh, in acute uh, distress, and uh, uh, the heart is the regular rhythm and the rate, and there is no murmur appreciated. And the lungs listen is clear to us bilaterally. And uh, in the abdominal examination, uh, there is uh, uh, just a mild epigastric tenderness on deep palpitation. There is no guarding or no rigidity, and also there is no signs of finding acute abdominal uh, changes. And there is also no swelling, no focal de deficits. And uh, uh, that concludes the physical examination. And for the labs, uh, first, uh, the patient we found the patient had leukocytosis. WBC is eighteen point five. Uh, it is neutrophil dominant on admission, and the hemoglobin is thirty point point eight. Uh, platelet is two two hundred and seventy nine, and uh, for the CMP. 
potas uh, sodium is 137, potassium 4.0, chloride 102, and bicarb is 23.3, BUN 17, creatinine 1.3, and glucose is 190. Calcium A eight point seven, uh, AST ALT are both found. AST is twenty eight, ALT is twenty three, and Arcforce is one hundred and fifty. Uh, the lipase is elevated five hundred and seventy seven, and total bilirubin is one point one. Lactate is two point five. Troponin is found eight, and the li uh, and also we test the lipids panel, the cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, and also LDL uh, are all within normal limit. And also we did the urine analysis, as Parisa mentioned, uh, each comeback has clear. The EKG and the chest x-ray uh, were all unremarkable. Okay, I will stop here. Uh, okay, thank you, Gia. I think I can uh, start. Uh, the good thing is we do not find any sign of the uh, serious infection, the blood pressure is, uh, and the heart rate and the normal sign, but this patient is febrile. We do not have any sign, sign of the uh, guarding and abdominal tenderness, which is make the possibility of uh, obstruction and perforation less likely. But coming back to the uh, the lab data, we are having the leukocytosis and then which is having, we are having also neutrophil dominancy. When we are putting that together with the high temperature, I think we need to think about it, the infectious causes at this point. But the, then um, when I'm coming down, we are having the elevated lipase and elevated uh, lactate. I think, um, I think we need to, again, come back to the GI tract and try to uh, influence our thinking on that way and try to link it to that area. I think some something in that area, it's getting irritated, which is leading to all that presentation because I think the life, I, I need to, I know that the patient, when I, they are having the uh, diabetes, I, don't, I I need to find out why the lipase is so elevated. But the alkaline phosphate, is the alkaline phosphate is elevated? What is the normal range? Yeah, alkaline uh, is elevated, yeah. I think um, when alkaline phosphate is elevated uh, and we don't have a bone pain, we know that something in the liver and in the bile duct, it's happening. I think we need to get probably more imaging uh, to see what is happening in that area. I think I need your help, Maddie, to figure out what is happening. I don't think you need any help at all. You are, you are spot on. And I think some of the findings that stood out to you are also what stood out to me. You know, I'm, I think going to the vitals, you mentioned the temperature. And I, I see in the chat, it also stood out to me, you know, when someone is febrile to 39 and is, and is in significant distress, I generally expect their heart rate as well to be elevated. So it stood out to me that um, the heart rate is 85. I remember learning that there is like a name for that sign. Maybe it's Faje, I, but I, I, um, I'm forgetting what that sign indicates. So that's going to be, that's like a gap in my knowledge that I want to look up afterwards because I know that there is, you can, there is some conclusion you can jump to when there's that kind of discrepancy between the temperature and the heart rate. So I'm going to have to look into that. Um, but the other findings that stood out to me was the mild epigastric tenderness, the neutrophil glucocytosis, you said, and the elevated lipase. Um, and, oh, I'm seeing in the chat, I just want to qu clarify something, Gia. Are there, were there elevated eosinophils or was it neutrophil predominance? I didn't, I just want to clarify that. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the information I also want to give in the admission. Uh, initially, it is neutrophil dominant, but uh, uh, we uh, follow up the CBC uh, in the next days. And uh, then in the day three, is, there is elevated eosinophil. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, um, that you know, changes our differential. But before we got that piece of information, what I wanted to highlight was the combination of epigastric abdominal pain and a lipase that's more than two to three times the upper limit of normal, we can already make a diagnosis to my understanding of pancreatitis, because my understanding of how we diagnose pancreatitis is you need, you know, three of the following. You need, you know, abdominal pain, epigastric abdominal pain, a lipase that's 
like three times the upper limit of normal and then imaging findings consistent with pancreatitis. And I believe here we are meeting two of those with the epigastric abdominal pain and the lipase um, greater than two to three times the limit of normal. And um, Parisa, maybe I'll pass that back to you. Like if we are if we are thinking that this patient does have pancreatitis, I imagine we'll get imaging to see what are some of the etiologies of that that you think of. Thank you, Maddy. I think for the uh, the common cause of the pancreatitis are the alcohol, the ethanol, the gallstone, and uh, they are. I think they they are some. I think a gut smash is the mnemonic. They are uh, idiopathic gallstone, uh, trauma, mumps, uh, some. Uh, uh, I think steroids, a scorpion, uh, and then uh, some autoimmune causes could be one of the causes. I do not see any uh, past medical history of using any alcohol, uh, but we need to we need to ask. But I think you, ha, you the diabetes is one of the risk factor for developing the uh, pancreatitis, but also that uh, this lipidemia might lead to be. Uh, my, might be one of the causes of hypertrigliceridemia, but I don't, do we have the triglyceride level here? No, don't. Okay, I think these are the main etiologies. Yeah, absolutely, spot on. The most common ones that I think of, just to emphasize what you said, are stones. I think that makes up around 40% of causes. And then the other most common one is alcohol, exactly as you said. And then Additional causes include elevated triglycerides, some um, toxic kind of metabolic causes, some drugs even, and um, also kind of some infections. Um, but I definitely think the big categories that cross my mind are stones, alcohol, and then triglycerides. And then I generally kind of look up maybe on UpToDate or another source what the other causes are. Um, and I think you made this point that there is an elevated elk foss, which can come from the biliary tree. So that's bringing into question, huh, do we need some type of imaging, like a right upper quadrant ultrasound to see, is there some stylation in the biliary tree? Is there type a stone that is causing both pancreatitis and this elevated elk foss? So that's one place that my mind is going. Um, and I heard, I think, I believe I heard Gia said that the triglycerides were normal, if I heard that right, um, though she does have that history of dyslipidemia, which brings into question um, that diagnosis for pancreatitis. Um, maybe, well, I think the elevated eosinophils is, that's also can be a, a, a pivot point, but maybe I will um, pass the mic back to Gia to give the rest of the information and if she's able to kind of clarify how high the eosinophils were, because um, that might be our, our next discussion, but we will see. Any other thoughts, Parisa, before um, Gia gives us the next the next part? I think, Maddie, the other interesting part in here, it's the uh, eosinophil is very being elevated. I don't know how we can... Uh, link it to the rest of the finding we are having at this point. But I think I, I totally agree that getting the imaging at this point will helping us to see uh, what is the what, what is the main source of getting high alkaline phosphatase. Are these, are these coming from the uh, biliary uh, tracts inside the liver parenchyma or are, are coming from the biliary tract outside the livers? And then maybe we could uh, find the reason for having the uh, high, uh, the rest of the finding from there. Yeah, totally agree. And then just to elevate some of the points, you know, some of the things we didn't call out, but the, there is an elevated lactate. And that's definitely something that kind of raises my concern. And um, going back to our VIPO mnemonic, is there some type of ischemia that's going on here resulting in elevated lactate? So definitely something we need to get to the bottom of. And I think this patient definitely warrants some type of imaging. Um, to, to see what's going on. Yeah. Right, Gia, back to you. Uh, love it. Love all the thoughts you, you guys mentioned. And you guys are brilliant and amazing. And uh, yeah, definitely in the next article, I will give all this imagery you want. Uh, and I'm also glad you mentioned all, and discuss all this like uh, etiology differentials. And that, that's going to be the uh, main topic in the next two articles. Uh, so uh, first, uh, first, we did the CT uh, for this patient. And we found this inflammation changes uh, around the pancreas 
this stomach and uh, also duodenal, uh, which may represent the pancreatitis uh, or gastri gastritis, duodenitis, and also disease. Uh, that's what we got from the CT. And then we also did the ultrasound abdomen. Uh, it showed it is there is a melt gallbladder wall thickening. There is no gauss, uh, gallstones, and uh, they, they found some small echogenic around 1.1 centimeter centimeter lesion uh, in the portal hepatitis of uncertain etiology. Uh, the tech, uh, tech, uh, technicians they raise the question of a stone in the duct in the duct, but uh, there is no biliary dilate, uh, dilatation, and so it uh, they think it is, this doesn't appear to um, uh, like look like a stone, and also uh, and uh, uh, they also propose if there are any signs or symptoms of for biliary obstruction, we can consider MRCP, and therefore we did the MR uh, MRCP. It showed some linear filling deficits uh, within the intrahepatic and extra haptic biliary tray uh, with calling of a linear def uh, de defect seen in the common uh, bile duct within the pancreatic head. And there is no stone uh, observed in the images. And uh, there is a peripancreatic edema, which consists of pancreatitis. I can show the MRCP uh, for you guys uh, to see this linear uh, deficits. Give me one minute. Let me share the share my screen with you guys. Yeah. Can you see? This arrow, the here there is a linear deficit in the common bile duct. Do you think they can only see my my screen? Let me stop sharing so you can okay. start sharing. I think I screen sharing now. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably the audience can see my screen because it shows I am screen sharing and I saw uh saw the mention that they can see it. Yeah. And Gia, just to clarify, so the, the imaging commented on a filling defect in the common bile duct, is that right? Yeah. But their impression was that it was did they add that their impression was that it was not a stone or were there any were there any other descriptions about the filling defect uh they just uh, describe it as a linear uh filling defect and uh, in the uh in the ct and uh, uh abdomen uh ultrasound uh, the uh report they just report there is no like concerns of stones and also there is no uh, dilation of the bile duct Got it. Thank you. Gia, were there any other information you want to share for this aliquot? Uh, that's all for this aliquot, yeah. And then uh, in the next aliquot, I will review the diagnosis and uh, show some like very um, uh, pic uh, amazing pictures. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Mariana, what are you thinking? And maybe, um, you know, now Gia has given us so much information. I always find at this point in the case, it can be helpful to kind of summarize your understanding like because there's so much information like how what problem representation would you form for this how would you summarize it in your mind yes. oh Franco just asked <laughs> uh so um at this point we are um taking care of a patient uh a 77 year old female with past medical history of diabetes presenting with abdominal pain and fever um, in the physical exam, what is very important is that sh she is febrile. Uh, she has she she is not hypotensive, but she uh, like the diastolic pressure is is low. So I am I am concerned for uh, concerned about this patient. Um, 
on the labs, we have um, increased uh, white blood count uh, with neutrophil predominance, but we also have eosinophilia, we have to consider that, uh, with increased lipase and increased alkafos. Uh, so at this point, uh, so we have, we have signs of pancreatitis here, and we, we have already talked about all the, all the uh, main causes of pancreatitis. Um, and the image does not show stones would be the, the major cause for that. So, and it does show something um, because it does, it's, it's not filling, uh, there's something obstructing the flow from the, uh, uh, from the gallbladder. So we have to figure out what is that. Uh, from what you have so far, uh, I would need your help here, Maddie, but I think we could have a stone that had already passed and, and uh, because of that, we have like no no signs of stone. So I wouldn't uh, rule out it um, completely yet, but also we have to uh, think about other causes of this obstruction. Um, from what I see, I don't think it's a tumor or nothing like that. It doesn't look like a tumor because it's too tiny. Uh, and because of the eosinophilia, we have to think about um, um, infectious, condi infectious conditions. So this is uh, also in my differential diagnosis. So yeah, I think I need your help here. This is uh, as far as I get, I got. Maria, that was that was such a, a brilliant discussion. And one of the things I really loved that you did is you are, you know, focusing on what is the most common and considering kind of atypical presentations of common things before jumping to more atypical diagnoses, which I think is so, so important. Um, so just want to like commend you for doing that. And, you know, exactly as you said. So I think What's interesting is, you know, we, before getting the imaging, we were able to make the diagnosis of pancreatitis and this imaging just kind of reinforced that this patient does have pancreatitis. And as you said, you know, looking for the most common cause, which is stones. And we are seeing, you know, some gallbladder wall thickening, but it seems that from the read that Gia gave, there were no obvious stones kind of causing, um, causing obstruction. But I really love the point you made is that maybe it's, maybe a stone has already passed. Um, and I completely agree with you that I think the main thing that changes the calculus in this case is the presence of eosinophilia. Um, I, I would, Gia, I'm not sure if I missed this. Did you, do you have the amount of like how much eosinophilia there was? No problem if not. I just thought I would clarify that. Yeah, give me one minute. Yeah, I have the uh, number, but I need to look it up in my phone. Yeah. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, so uh, uh, in the day three, the patient has elevated eosinophilia, both percentage and uh, uh, absolute count. And the, uh, let me see, the count is uh, 0 0.56, and the percentage is 5.4. Got it. Okay, thank you. So pretty significantly elevated. Um, so maybe I'll turn it back to either Mariana or Prisa. If you have any thoughts with this eosinophilia, uh, Mariana, you mentioned some you know, we should consider some infections. What were some of the types of infections you were thinking we should consider in someone with eosinophilia? Uh, I think the most important is uh, parasitic infections with, uh, because they show up with eosinophilia. Um, honestly, I, I haven't uh, seen a case like that before, but people in the chat, they are talking about ascaris. So I think it has to be in our differential diagnosis for. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you that I think when I see eosinophilia, I'm generally considering like, are there some type of parasitics, parasitic infections that, that could be causing this, um, some liver, some flukes, for example. Um, and, you know, what I would be doing in real life is now, you know, I wasn't really considering this patient's social history where she was from, because plenty of people travel to and from the Philippines and don't have eosinophilia. But now I'm you know, bringing that detail back into the center point. And now I'm, I would probably be Googling, you know, like eosinophilia plus infections common to, I don't know, endemic to the Philippines, just to see is there, is that related potentially? Um, and yeah, probably in real life, I would be looking up, you know, eosinophilia and, um, you know, common bugs that go to the, the, the um, biliary tree. I think just some of the things that I, I definitely have to do some reading on this after, but um, does 
I feel like I have an association with schistosomiasis maybe going to the liver and biliary tree, um, strongy going there, but I, I'm definitely don't feel comfortable in that area. So I would be doing a lot of Googling, but I think, um, I think that's, what's kind of beautiful about clinical reasoning and getting to this point that we now, um, what we do know is that this patient has pancreatitis and has some dilation in the biliary tree and has some eosinophilia. And I think with that, you know, you're able to go to a lot of the resources on online and figure out what tests we should send to look for potential infections. But I, I am right there with you that I'm concerned for some type of potentially parasitic infection um, causing this eosinophilia and invading this the biliary tree causing the stricture. I'm, I'm really curious about the stricture. Like what could be kind of a linear thing <laughs> blocking the CBD? And is that an organism that we're able to see some type of worm? I don't know, but I, I'm a little out of my depths here, but that's, that's where my thoughts are. Any other, anything else to add, Precent or Mariana? I think Gia is going to give us the diagnosis next. No, I don't have anything else, Maddie. I think it, I, I know it's, I think it's not a, a, a stricture, it is a filling defect, but I know that for the biliary stricture, we needed to think about any procedure related. To, for example, if somebody had already done the ERCP or we are thinking about maybe some, someone has, uh, when somebody is critically ill and they are in the uh, ICU, they might have some ischemic injury to their biliary duct and some, for example, chronic biliary flux might present in this way, but... I, I for also for some chronic presentation, I'm I will think about some IgG4 I know might present this way. I learned it in the VMR. <laughs> I also know that primary sclerizing cholangitis might present this way, but I've I know it, it people are talking about it in the chat, but I've I had no idea that ascaris might be bl blocking the ball back like this. It is so interesting. I'm excited to learn from Gia. Mariana, anything else you want to add before Gia teaches us? No, I am right there with you. I think we uh, the most important thing was that um, we diagnosed pancreatitis and now we have to think what is uh, obstructing the flow so we can um, treat this patient. Yeah, I agree. All right, Gia, back to you. Yeah, great thoughts. And actually, we uh, found a gas some imaging and found the culprit. And uh, so because of this, also like a, a kind of linear uh, funding uh, to me, uh, to us, so we consult the GI and the GI did the scope. And in the scope, they found a worm. Let me show the uh, picture. Here we are. Yeah, can you see the picture now? Yeah, we've, oh, yeah, this is exactly uh, like catch the picture of this worm under the scope. And then they uh, pick this single worm out. And then we also send this worm to, uh, for the parasite, uh, parasite ident identification. And uh, uh, it revealed this worm is Ascaris. And uh, so uh, uh, talking about the treatment, we give the patient abendazole uh, just once. And also, uh, we also uh, recommend the household to also uh, to receive the abendazole just once. And because the patient is from the uh, endemic area and she will go back to Philippines uh, after two months. So we recommend the patient to receive the abendazole uh, annually, uh, take it uh, uh, once every year to uh, prevent to the parasite. Oh my gosh, Gia, I am speechless. That is that is a large worm, and I am so. Um, I can just only imagine how painful that must have been for the patient. But just, I'm so glad that you helped make this diagnosis. I'm just to clarify, did you see this case? Uh, actually, I uh, I was at uh, infectious disease, and we are consult to treat the case. We are also very shocked and uh, like to see these pictures. Yeah, because it's also my first case of parasite. Uh, I know uh, probably for us, we learn a lot from medical school. We uh, learn this like life cycle such things. We only saw the pictures on the textbook, but it's the first time for me to see this uh, parasite infection case in the like real life in a real person. Yeah. I am for it. If I could just ask one last question. So I'm, you know, when you saw the worm, of course, that, you know, probably makes an diagnosis. Did you, how did you figure out it was 
um, as ascaricis? Uh, I think uh, initially uh, it is from the shape uh, and also considering the life cycles, as you guys mentioned before, like uh, how these different uh, parasites can uh, live in different organs. And uh, uh, of course, the uh, most important thing is the, the paras parasitic identification, just send this sample to the PCR. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely amazing case, Gia. Thank you so much for presenting. Uh, Prisa, Mariana, how do you both feel? Oh my God, it was so interesting, Gia. I, I think it is the beauty of this clinical reasoning. We were thinking about UTI, DKA, myocardial infarction, and now we are finding that ascarsis in the common bite. Like, so interesting. Thank you, Gia, for presenting this case to us. Yeah, this is very interesting indeed. Thank you very much, Gia. And another thing that came up to my mind now, I just would like to ask you, so if I'm not wrong, when we were presenting, uh, did you have the hemoglobin of this patient? Did you say it was um, 7.8 after it was corrected? So I'm not sure if, I, what, if it was normal or low. Yeah, the hemoglobin is fine, yeah. Oh, okay. And I, I actually, I feel the patient looks like uh, better than uh, than the labs appeared. Yeah, she's just like comfortably lying on the bed and like smelling to us. Very nice lady. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, because if uh, hemoglobin was low, we, uh, this could be another clue for us that uh, a patient had ascaris. So very, very, very interesting case. Thank you very much for bringing. Yeah, and also thank you all for attending this uh, discussion. I was very like, uh, uh, like shocked by your uh, all guys like brilliant uh, knowledge and like comprehensive discussion. That's very amazing. Yeah. Friends, thank you so, so much for being the first residency participating in our IMG VMR and bring, bringing a bug. I am so, so happy. <laughs> I'm actually ecstatic, so, um, but as much as I would like to keep talking about ID Pearls and ID Love, and again, shout out to Anmol who help us with the teaching points, who, by the way, is a future PGY one too. want <laughs> to. Um, we will, I will pass the mic to Dr. Ravi and his team to talk about a little bit more about your residency how does a day in your life look like? How is the program and everything that's very interesting. For me, I'm already sold. Like having these ID cases are like, it's already gold. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Yasmin. And uh, such a wonderful job, Gia. And when Gia brought this case to me, I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is a phenomenal case. It doesn't have to be so complex, but I was like, did we really have this case? I, I did not know about this case at all. So. I would love to be right there next to you in ID rotation, seeing these cases, but I'm great. You had such a wonderful experience on infectious disease. And it just kind of showcases that what's really interesting. I've been at uh, Sinai for 17 years and um, the population is ever expanding. So we're getting patients from all over the world now coming in and bringing all sorts of different conditions. We've had like very odd sort of um, parasitic infections. I presented recently the, there was a patient with um, babesiosis, Lyme. We've had many cases of malaria. We've had parasitic infections, leptospirosis. So just you learn so much from these cases. And I just also want to uh, highlight uh, the incredible, um, the thinking here exhibited by Madalena, Parisa, Mariana. This just speaks volumes to what you get out of CPS and joining. And just just being able to to perform this iterative process, with, which we do day in, day out. So there's type two thinking, which then we hope to adapt into type one thinking on the floors to make us very efficient clinicians. So uh, we see a lot of patient volumes, we're busy in residency and also as attendings and any subspecialties that you go into. So you want to at least be in a program where you're able to learn uh, every day and also be able to practice this kind of reasoning and the ACGME that overlooks all the residency programs in the United States wants us to teach this, um, which is why I come here. So that way I can uh, get better in teaching this and bring this back to my program. And then also we nerd out with Franco about cases and morning reports, and he'll always 
attest that I'm sitting at the front row uh, for any morning report that uh, any one of these um, individuals do. But um, I'm going to turn the mic over to, to Franco and uh, just talk about uh, his experience mm -hmm. at Sinai. So uh, my experience at Sinai is basically the best family ever. Uh, you had like a amazing group of people that comes from diverse backgrounds. Uh, everybody's understanding, everybody's collegiality. It's upstanding. Uh, you have a lot of like uh, work-life balance. Your rotations are definitely well balanced. You got a lot of exposure to different things. You also had opportunities to uh, do research and to go in for away rotations every every single year, at least one month. Uh, you also get to work with the underserved population around Baltimore in different contexts. So you get a lot of like uh, training in cultural competence just by practicing in uh, with this uh, underserved population as well. Uh, on top of that, I think the most important is the people. Like people is always uh, helping each other. People always takes uh, a good amount of their time about making sure that you're right making sure that you're fine, making sure that you have enough time to do things. Um, it's just the best family ever and the best welcoming uh, environment for somebody that is going to train in the U.S. and gives you an open doors that are beyond imaginable. And I think, yeah, there is a perfect place. <laughs> um, I can turn the mic over to Gia just to sort of reflect on her couple of months as she's been with us. Yeah, I highly agree with Franco that I love, love people here because I think in the recent like uh, uh, two to three months, I got a lot of support from people around. And I also like uh, really learn different things from different people because I think because uh, our program is very diverse. We have uh, people from all over the, uh, the world and uh, they have different background. Uh, so I really can uh, learn like new things from uh, people around me, like no matter from uh, not only limited to medical knowledge but also to their like personality to their like working habits yeah so i really enjoy uh working here and i'm also looking forward to uh see some new face maybe from today's meeting zoom, uh, zoom meeting in the next year i'm also gonna um, ask clinton one of our chiefs there you are clinton yeah who actually presented a couple of years ago for as a pgy1 on on um, sinai cps uh, now you're ready to, to graduate and hopefully go for fellowship. And uh, actually, both Clinton and Franco have been very successful in getting a large number. Actually, I've never heard of the amount of interviews that you've both gone for palm crit and rheumatology. So it's just uh, amazing to be able to be part of your springboarding into a subspecialty. But uh, I'll ask Clinton to unmute and just share some I think a lot of people here also come from different cultural backgrounds. One, one thing I would say is I think the Sinai Hospital family is very culturally sensitive. And so everyone's, again, very collegial. Everyone's fully aware about, you know, how hard it is to transition into the, of course, the healthcare system in the United States. I came from the Philippines. So the fact that Gia brought a case that was from the Philippines, I immediately tried to re remember all the things that I you know, I've encountered in the past, but again, the family here that, you know, the, the relationship that I tend to establish is something that I know I'll cherish lifelong. And I feel that sense of collegial, collegiality ever since I just walked into the hospital. Uh, and it's not just the, just the program itself. Everyone is in the hospital is very collegial. Everyone is very friendly. Uh, and again, it's a very welcoming atmosphere that I am just happy to be part of this program to train. Yeah, just a, I want to add like a couple of my favorite things that I've been able to do. Uh, one is simulation. Everybody here in CPS knows I love medical simulation. So uh, being at this kind of program, so we are very we're probably the largest community program in in Maryland, and so we're building probably more than we'll be at over five hundred beds, and we're a level two trauma center. We actually have a large, very large GME, so you work shoulder to shoulder with surgical residents, ophthalmology residents, pediatric residents, OB-GYN patient, I mean, residents, uh, orthopedic, we started an orthopedic residency uh, recently as well, and we're ever expanding. So we have a large, very large GME. So whatever affects one residency program affects the other. So uh, the voice for residents in GME is uh, quite, quite loud. So 
Um, we do quite a bit for all the residents. And then we recently became a, a site for the George Washington Medical University medical students year three and four. Uh, I, we developed a regional medical campus. So we actually have our own medical students that rotate. They come here and they've also benefited from the amount of teaching that happens here from all the way from uh, interns like Gia and um, residents, attendings and uh, subspecialists. So the, the students have been very happy. And uh, actually, I, I received great feedback, uh, something what Franco was saying, one of the students, they, they choose where they want to do year three and four. And uh, a number of them chose to do it at Sinai to do all their medical clerkships. And one of them was like, you know what, I really appreciated that you all stated that we have your backs. So backs in that, uh, creating a safe learning environment. I think the first thing, and which CPS also professes to, is having a safe learning environment. Second thing is EQ is as important as IQ. So any one of you will join a residency program is very important. Yes, having a program where EQ is important because we will teach you everything. So we don't expect everybody to come to the table knowing uh, all sorts of medical things. But once you come, um, we create an environment where you are exposed to many different things and you are then also taught. So, um, But just coming and bringing the motivation, and I can just say coming to CPS motivates us to learn because you are exposed to so many different things. And I think it sets you up um, for success. Uh, because the amount of medical knowledge, I think I've probably been exposed to so many cases from CPS. My knowledge is ever expanding. It's very difficult in a busy world to read and uh, attend conferences, but uh, being able to sit on CPS once or twice a week, I think it, it you just take away so many different things. Um, anybody else from, any questions from anybody about the program or I'll just open it up? Or anybody else from Sinai that wants to sort of unmute and talk? Ravi, I think we have a um, question in the chat. Please correct me if I say your name wrong, Eugene. Um, yeah, it's correct, Eugene. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ravi, for the, the information about the program. I'm very excited. Um, I, I just wanted to know how would you how does the program support the intern on day one? I just want to know once uh, you have a pager right with you in the program, how do you support the, the intern? That's a fantastic question. So day one for an American graduate is different from day one for an IMG because with an American medical student or European, you, you kind of know the workflow, right? So how to write a SOAP note, how to round the efficiencies of, the day and we in the united states we write some of the longest notes uh in the world so uh we've had a number of of um, residents join one actually came from liverpool england and he's like never wrote this this many notes for patients even in the in the nhs so uh i i think uh from day one but i like to kind of rewind to two weeks before day one uh, where you know a program is going to set you up for success by giving you a very detailed walkthrough and orientation and so on. So one thing I really proud myself about, I was like, a, probably a couple of years back, I was like, uh, our IMGs are having difficulties on day one. And I think writing notes is a big part of that. So what can we do to make the experience better? So we started a sim lab where we walk through how to write a note. So we present a patient and you write a note, admission note, clinic note, and that way you practice this and that way you can get an idea on what, how to write these notes on day one. Second thing, the pager, our residents are great. They will actually help you. So if you're overwhelmed, they're like, can I take your pager? And this is without me giving them instruction, like, could you do this? Attendings, even I was with uh, an intern and they were getting busy with admissions and so on. So I'm like, I'll, I can help you. Let me do an admission. Nobody wants an attending to then chime in because they feel maybe they're not doing their work, but it's okay. We understand. And on weekends, we'll, we'll take a few patients and write notes because they could be a, an intern covering the whole team uh, to lessen the load on, on the intern. So yeah, day one, you will learn. It's always very difficult. 
and um, I can call on a number of people. I guess we can ask uh, Gia day one or Franco day one how it was. But uh, I, I think a program where you have a large number of IMGs can understand what the process is like and the difficulties because we've had so many people go through this. And I've had, it's it's just amazing. I've had interns come in, they were like, brilliant but just having a difficult time with the workflow and started to have a lot of stress because it didn't feel like they were measuring up to their potential but by pgy2 they're like walking like superstars and just amazing residents and uh they're able to one one evaluation or sort of measure of your evaluation as a as a intern as a resident is your ability to practice independently are you independent in your medical knowledge in your practice-based learning system-based practice these are the core measures that we judge you by for the ACGME to determine if you're ready for independent practice. So a lot of them are hitting that benchmark by second year. Franco, you want to talk about your day one? I was trying to. Okay, perfect. So uh, day one, I think I can even go a little. So day one, my senior took my pager, um, Jeremiah, he was amazing. He guided me, he stayed a little with me while, while I was writing the notes. Um, I had like floors there. Uh, he also on day one, make sure that I only carry about the certain amount of work that I was supposed to do, like not overwhelming at all. Uh, I didn't worry about any of the orders when I was on floors on the first day. They were doing everything from that perspective or just concentrate on seeing the patient, getting notes, and also getting the presentation accurate. And I would also say that from the attendance perspective, they will also, because in my case, uh, my medical school, everything was in Spanish. So all my medical knowledge is in Spanish. So when translating to English on day one, you get a little bit like <laughs> bumps on there. So they're really patients about how I was presenting my patient and how they were concentrating on the facts that, okay, I'm doing the work, I'm doing the, giving the facts, despite being a little slower just because of the language. Uh, and they were amazing. And then I always do the same thing that the, my senior did to me, like make sure that everybody's eating, make sure that you have enough time to eat, you stop, everything and then you go to it. I always tell the, the interest you need to go eat. Um, I think that's one of the important things because you also go and decompress for a second, forgetting about everything, don't care about the patients and little things. I think on day one, those are kind of like the hallmarks that just the collegiality of having your backup, somebody that already go through that pathway, being a senior and then the attendings and then just waiting for you to shine. I think that's the most important thing. Um, I think we've had the pleasure of even helping some CPS members. I'm going to call them Yasmin actually rotated with me at Sinai and being an outsider and not having any, um, I guess, input, I guess, um, I guess affiliation with Sinai, definitely, being a resident definitely. and so on. Yeah. If you want to share your experience as a, as a rotator. Of course it was, it was um, a very, insightful experience it was my first experience rotating as an observer in the U.S. and uh, again shout out to our case review committee right now because thanks to CP solvers I learned to how to present cases and something that I think I don't know if you have noticed as IMGs is that when you arrive here even if we talk we're all here talking in English and uh, conversing and everything but when you get there you can get frozen like uh, how do I present this case I, it's not in Spanish. How do I say this? So um, having the opportunity and a, a team that's very welcoming, that's very, uh, they have a lot of compassion for like uh, for teaching, um, not to diminish my the Mexican experience in medical school. But I think that as IMGs, generally, we come from spaces where it's a little bit hostile the way that we learn. That if you do... Uh, you make a mistake, you are reprimanded. This was completely different. Like they teach you, they take their time, even if the residents were very, very um, 
um, busy, they will take their time. And uh, I rotated with um, uh, Dr. Saad. Uh, she was amazing. I could see also for all the women uh, identifying IMGs who want to be moms, she had a lot of, of um, support from the program. She could um, take her time to go and, and, and like um, have her milk ready, stuff like that. Things that as women, we also looking forward to maybe have children in the future, but also pursue a career in medicine. Having a program that is very conscious about that is, is very important. So that's, I think that's a little piece of information that could be important. Uh, but I think I've talked a lot and we have a, a couple more questions. Uh, first, uh, and again, correct me if I say the name wrong, Nodin Farid, uh, could you like to read yes. your question? Hi. Out Hi, my name is Naurin. Uh, I want to first thank you guys for hosting this session. I absolutely learned a lot. And my question was, uh, I know that residency will have both really rough days and really good days. And I'm just wondering if I could hear from the residents, what was your worst day so far and how did the program help you? Thank you. Linton, you want to tackle that? Yes. So I actually was trying to remember a bad day. Well, admittedly, there were more good days than bad days, thankfully, when I've been training. But uh, I would say I think there was a particular time when I was on nights that was particularly challenging, especially when you, you know, rise up the ranks and you become a second year resident, you're you're you have more clinical re responsibilities. Uh, it was just a di difficult uh, workload at that time. And I remember a uh, patient ultimately did not uh, you know, did not survive over the night. And so that was a, that was a major hit, of course, for anyone, you know, losing a patient is never something that's easy. And I had reached out to, to my chief residents at that time and some seniors as well, and even the program leadership. And I kid you not, the following day, I had people checking in on me, program leadership, Dr. Kun Kun even, you know, dropped by to see me and say, hey, are you doing okay? How, how was, how, what happened that night? Would you like to talk about it? And it was just an open and very supportive atmosphere. And, you know, it's, it's again, we're in this field, we're in this very stress, high stress environment a lot of times. And, you know, things don't always go according to plan. And it's just so, I'm just so thankful that I'm in a program that the leadership voluntarily reaches out to me. And it's not just me, you know, always asking, uh, hey, I need help. And, you know, being set aside, but I really appreciate how proactive the program is on that regard as well. And again, it, it stems from just from seniors to chief residents and even the program leadership. And I think that alone speaks a lot. Yeah, I just want to add uh, that it is a, a privilege to be able to, to help uh, the number of residents that come to us for three years to work with us. And we always say we we stand on the shoulders of giants, and I've had the privilege to to work under such a, a great program director, Dr. Richard Williams, who used to come on here. He was the program director of MedStar, and actually had mentored many many IMGs, many people from across the country, across the world as well, and many of them um, still like to this day appreciate what he's done for them. And is also a very good teacher, and he still will teach at MedStar in Baltimore, which um, I think has sort of conglomerated into the largest residency program in the U.S. Uh, with like a large number of, of residents. So we have large, a lot of residents that actually do match there. And um, like because of the way he was, that that kind of um, effect that affected me. And then hopefully the residents learned from us. And then they go on and then take this, take this forward as well. So take this, take these attributes forward, which is to permeate knowledge, kindness, and um, also professionalism and all of the wonderful attributes that we need to be a, a, a to be a medical practitioner in the US. And yeah, just to say, like, yeah, well, I mean. There's so many programs, many, many wonderful programs, and all there's the great things about we're going to have a lot of different programs, and not every, every program cannot take every resident in the U.S. So it's it's uh, encouraging to be able to take a large number of very good 
applicants and uh, applicants with different range in scores. People ask, like, do you only take like high uh, USMLE scoring uh, uh, interns or applicants? No, we we pick from a wide variety because there's sometimes you you find uh, different different um, interns with different attributes with lower scores and then they end up being remarkable clinicians and uh, they bring so many different things to the program. So you don't want to miss them. So you want to at least pick from a wide variety of different, different scores or different applicants with, with um, certain attributes that you may not have in the program. Back to you, Yasmin. Thank you so much for that, for that comment. Honestly, as an IMG with a rocky road on the steps, it's uh, always uh, daunting to go through this process and thinking, my, am I a good match or not? So having uh, this opportunity, uh, bringing programs here and talking about uh, how you go through this process as the program director and as chief residence, uh, I, I think that it helps a lot for a lot of us. Um, we do have another question. Uh, Saurab, um, would you like to unmute yourself? I don't, I don't see him in my screen. Hi. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, also, I'd like to thank everybody for this wonderful session. And I would also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Tang and Dr. Murilo for bagging a lot of interviews for their fellowship. I wish them best of luck for their fellowship season. And uh, my question is re regarding fellowship. Uh, so it looks like the program is really supportive. So uh, I would like to ask uh, how supportive is the program? Like anything you want to mention? Uh, how, what are the helps? you guys get from the program do you uh, like for preparation of your fellowship and all thank you i mean i guess i could start now since i am undergoing the fellowship uh, experience uh one thing i can say because i am applying for pulmonary critical care medicine uh i think it's one of the uh one of the top competitive specialties again the, the way the curriculum is structured, at least in our residency program, we're free to sort of craft our own uh, career in a sense. So I was able to have a lot of opportunities getting exposure to the pulmonary and critical care uh, medicine. And with our second and third year, you do have the opportunity to construct your own away electives. And so you have the opportunity to rotate in outside institutions, even as far as a different state. Uh, I chose to just stay locally. So, but again, being in a strategic location like Baltimore, you have two other tertiary level uh, facilities like Hopkins, Maryland, University of Maryland, they're just literally next door to us. And so to be situated in this area, I think it's really a, a positive thing. I think one thing that one of my old seniors told me is nowhere in the entire country do you have two major transplant centers or major tertiary centers literally within the same city. And that made me realize how strategic the location is. And, you know, the fact that you have other major institutions here, MedStar, St. Agnes, all of these facilities, you do have the opportunity as well to tap into and reach out to. In terms of how supportive as well the program is to the fellowship, I can say for certain after interacting with a lot of other fellowship applicants uh, throughout the interview season, I think our program has been the most supportive in a sense that they don't want us to miss any interview opportunities. They 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 literally try to promote you to go to go full on for all of your interviews. They never let any resident miss any of their interviews, uh, and they make appropriate arrangements to to sort of of course balance patient care and make sure that there is no lapse in patient care, but at the same time allow you the time and you know protect the time to just focus on your interview because they they do realize that this is the next step in your career and they want to make sure that they 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 support you in that regard and i can basically echo everything that clinton say um and i think the most important thing is also if you're planning to go for a fellowship or you're planning to go to for a hospital job sinai gives you opportunities to interview for both of the things um and if you're going for fellowship and it's a field that you love and you put all the effort everything starts with you uh, the role of the program is to give you not to tie not to give you like any other like barriers to grow on your role as a prospect fellow so the fact that clinton said that we can go for away rotation 
get mentors, not only at Sinai, but also outside Sinai, work on the research, having a research away or not just a clinical away makes a huge difference. But everything starts also with you. What do you want to do if you have passion for something and the, the program is the vehicle for your passion to grow? So I think that's the most important thing of Sinai. That's an excellent vehicle for finding a way to get your passion and your dreams come true regarding a fellowship or regarding a hospitalist position and all those things. And just to add to that, uh, as part of our curriculum, we do have two away rotations built in at Hopkins. One is transplant and the other is hemonc. Um, so those are two experiences that every resident gets to participate in, which is, which is invaluable. It's always good. I always tell people go outside and see the world and see how medicine is rather than just practice within the silo of your training program because it opens your minds and also support financially and also time-wise for going to conferences. Very important to go to conferences and also expand your mind and see the the, the greater world and see what other people are doing. So um, I'm always happy to sign those papers and send people out uh, and also rotations at local, local institutions. NIH is one as well. Uh, Georgetown, GW, Hopkins, Maryland, and even as far as uh, we've had residents go rotate at Stanford and other places too. So, uh, so it's always great to to make holes in the schedule to allow them to do that as well. Thank you so much for the insight. Thank you so much. I it's really it's really um, nice to see how programs. Uh, can support us as IMGs to pursue this fellowship and all the best to Franco and Clinton. We're going to see them as PCCM and rheumatology fellows in the future. Um, so I think that we don't have any other questions so far in the chat and being very mindful of your time. If you want to say any last comments, Yeah, I'll just say uh, very excited. We start app, uh, interviews on Monday, and I see a lot of people that will potentially be interviewing with us, and we're still in sending out invites, and people are asking, and and uh, but but uh, I wouldn't fret about it. Uh, hopefully, everybody's getting a lot of interviews, so that way they have uh, a great chance to match. And uh, I just want to wish everybody the best of luck that that whoever is applying for match twenty twenty five, and do come back. Um, we we try and uh, answer, answer questions on our IMG initiative on the weekends and Yasmin, Deborah helping with that uh, in regards to, to interviews and so on. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Back to you, Yasmin. Thank you so, so much. And to everyone who will be watching us on YouTube, if you want to bring your residency, Deborah and I will most definitely be reaching out to you. So keep tuned and see you next Saturday. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Thanks.